I really do think, I mean, this is a passion of mine, but I feel like, okay, it may take me my whole life to persuade <laughs> even my fellow Catholics, but I really think that it is something that we have ab abandoned very much to our own detriment. Hello, welcome everyone. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hello. Great to have you all joining. Hi. Hi there. How's everyone doing tonight? You want to put in chat? <laughs> How's it going? And if you're fasting, you. how your fast is going? It's right at the top of the hour and we've already got a great turnout. So that's fabulous. Um, just a couple quick announcements. So we have a group fast that will be starting the first Monday of June. So if you're interested in doing that with us, um, there'll be a, a 24, a 48, 72 hour variety. Um, so keep your eyes out on the Fasting Flamingo Facebook group. Um, and also, um, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, and if you don't mind clicking the subscribe button, you'd be helping me out because we just launched it. So it, it's still pretty new. Um, for those who are members of the Fasting Flamingo, we're actually doing this as our next book club book. We voted on it uh, this past Sunday. And so um, I think mid-June, we'll start reading your book. So that's great to know there's a study guide. Maybe we can kind of use that to help. Oh, absolutely. All right, well, thank you all so much for joining this special event. Um, this is the first live Q&A that we've ever done with an author at the Fasting Flamingo. And we're thrilled to have Dr. Jay Richards joining us. Thank you. A brief introduction of Dr. Richards. So he is the author of this book here, um, Eat Fast Feast, <laughs> uh, Heal Your Body While Feeding Your Soul, A Christian Guide to Fasting. And he has authored multiple New York Times bestselling books. He's a professor at the Bush School of Business at Catholic uh, Catholic. University of America. And personally, he is a faster. So it's great to have you joining us, Dr. Richards. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be with you. Yeah. And the way the format for tonight's event is going to go is mm -hmm. that we'll start with a few questions that I've kind of um, selected from ones that people have submitted. And then I'll have a yeah. few directly verbatim from some of you who had very specifically worded questions that I want to make sure I get to you. <laughs> Um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A from the rest of the group. So if you have a question for Dr. Richards or do as he starts to talk, um, just in chat, write question or write Q, and then we'll know kind of the order in which they're coming in. And we will do our best to get to as many questions as we can tonight. So does that sound good to everyone? Thumbs up. And if you're just joining, great, thank you. Um, and if you're just joining, please mute yourself. I'm going to try to catch anybody that isn't muted. Um, but inevitably somebody, you know, will have a dog barking in the background or something happen <laughs> when you have this many people on a call. Um, and then you mentioned in your book that you initially fasted um, prior to a medical exam and that you were surprised yeah. by how physically strong you felt and the mental clarity. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of led you into looking at the history of fasting in Christianity and in yeah. world religions more broadly. Um, so I'm really right. curious, what was the most surprising thing you found out? Like what really kind of blew you away when you started to investigate this? Probably, I mean, I knew intellectually that every religious tradition, with the exception of Zoroastrianism, so that's the only one I've been able to find, and you know, how many Zoroastrians have you met lately? I mean, the, every major religion has, at least traditionally, as some kind of fasting regimen. Um, and in the Christian tradition, the, the tradition that has retained it, the, the really ancient practice, is really the Eastern Orthodox and Eastern Rite Christians who have these kind of massive fast, fasting schedules. If you go to Crete, for instance, which is Greek Orthodox, the whole island fasts, have these, these massive fasts. Um, and so I knew that intellectually, but I guess the thing that sort of surprised me was that I had always imagined fasting as purely a, a sort of spiritual sacrifice in which you're actually kind of sacrificing bodily health for a spiritual discipline. So you're actually, you know, it's literally, okay, I'm, I'm trading off. It's kind of like a crucifixion, right? Nobody thinks crucifixion is not beneficial for you, for your health, but Christ dies on the cross um, for a spiritual benefit for, for humanity. That's how I imagined fasting, is that it was just a sort of trade-off in which you, as Catholics will say, you mortify the flesh 
um, in order to gain some kind of spiritual benefit, increase in, in, in spiritual strength or capacity for prayer. And so to discover that, no, in fact, there are a bunch of amazing physiological benefits to fasting. Uh, so there are both spiritual and physical benefits to fasting, which really makes sense if we're, if we're body-soul hybrids or unities that, that both of these things uh, should happen in this way. So that was the kind of the first thing. And then the second thing was that um, fasting doesn't have to be as hard as it is because most of us imagine, well, somehow people, I don't know, in the fourth century, uh, AD, they were maybe more spiritually disciplined or something, or maybe they didn't have any food anyway, so they just fasted. And But we can't do it now, and it's just way too hard. And to realize, that, no, it, it, it's so hard largely because we don't fast and because of the standard American diet, which is really, really heavy on sugars. And so we're using this one metabolic pathway all the time, which runs on sugar, uh, rather than using our hybrid system, which, you know, we, we can use fat for fuel and we can use sugar for fuel. And if we're doing that normally in our eating patterns, then fasting, it's still a sacrifice, but it's not torture. And so that was the thing that is, for me, it was just kind of a serendipitous discovery that got me on this path of kind of obsessively studying the subject. So I, I can completely relate to obsessively studying the subject. And I think a lot of people on this call can as well, that we've gone through kind of similar journeys. Um, and, and some of these surprises, I mean, like you're saying, where it isn't supposed to be as hard as it is for a lot of us um, who were eating a standard American diet or a Western diet um, with a lot of sugar and a lot of processed foods. So yeah, that's so cool. Um, so I guess my next question for you is, and you talk about, about this in the book, if we lived a thousand years ago, what would Christians be doing? What would their normal fasting protocol, so to speak, be? Um, you know, would they be fasting Wednesdays and Saturdays? Would they be doing all 40 days for Lent? Would they be fasting on saint days? What, what do you think that would have looked like in the early days of the church? Yeah, definitely. Let's go to 1000 AD. So this would have been before the split between East and West, which kind of officially that this great schism of Christendom happened in 1054 AD. So let's say 1000 AD, so that the West and the East are still united. There's still the Greek, everybody's kind of speaking Greek in the East, and uh, there's a Greek liturgy, and then there was a Latin liturgy in the West, but the church was still unified. Uh, this is basically what the fasting uh, routine would have looked like, is that virtually all Christians would have fasted every Wednesday and Friday. So every week uh, they would have fasted on those two days, Wednesday um, and, and Friday is, Wednesday is the day Jesus is betrayed traditionally by Judas. Friday is, of course, the day that he's crucified, so a, a good Friday. Um, and so sort of as a representation of the, the suffering of Christ on Wednesday and Friday, you fast. Sunday's a feast, though, by the way. People, are, including a lot of Christians, don't know this, but sun, every Sunday is a little mini feast day. And so that's the interesting thing is that at least in the Christian tradition, the, the fasting always seems to be accompanied by feasting. So there would have been a Wednesday, Friday fast, little mini feasts on Sunday. They would have just by nature been doing what we call intermittent fasting. So that just means that they wouldn't have been eating all day, every day. And that was just really a lifestyle thing because people couldn't, you know, they didn't have wheat thins in boxes to sit and eat, you know, in their protein shake right before they went to bed. And so they tended to eat what we would think of as intermittent fasting, probably about an eight hour period during the day, never more than 12 hours because they went to sleep when it got dark. So they'd have done that. Uh, and then they had these long fa uh, fasting schedules of Lent, certainly, which is, it's really 40 days, it's really 46 days if you count it up plus the Sundays. So they had that, but it's broken by many feasts on Sunday. Um, so there's the Lenten fast, there's an Advent fast, which is completely dropped out. People don't even think of Advent as a fasting uh, period. But remember, there's a big feast of Christmas. So uh, it makes sense that there would be a fasting season before that. Um, and then there was actually a, a fasting period that still retained in Eastern Orthodoxy, usually in June. It was sort of a fast uh, of the apostles, Peter and Paul. And that's, that's something that was common in the East, but not in the West. And so basically you had effectively people not eating all the time during the day. They had a weekly fasting schedule of Friday and Wednesday and Friday, plus a feast on Sunday. And then they had these big seasonal fasts followed by feasts and everybody did it. And that was in some ways the sort of benefit 
is that it's a heck of a lot easier if everybody's doing this for you to do it as well, as opposed to if all of your friends, you know, always get a caramel frappuccino at 4 p.m. every day and you're the only one fasting, it's way harder. Um, and so that, that that's the sort of nice thing. A kind of interesting aside is Ansel Keys, the guy that um, first did the research that suggested that fat was terrible and we shouldn't eat fat. And I think it's deeply flawed for various reasons. But one of the countries that he studied uh, was Crete. And he actually studied Crete during the Greek Orthodox fast, right? And so he took what they were doing during the Greek Orthodox fast, assumed they ate like that all the time and thought, well, this is kind of a healthy way to eat. Um, and he ignored the fact that they were in a fast. Um, and so there are pockets of the world where this still continues, but it tends to be either the Muslim world, which does the monthly Ramadan feast, um, or places where Eastern Orthodox Christianity is still very, very prevalent. Yeah, I love that story about Crete because I mean, it is, it's so ridiculous, like how leaving out that much fasting didn't weigh into what he was considering was their diet. Exactly. Incredible. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, and for Lent, I do want to just kind of ask you a little bit of a follow up question. For Lent, you know, were people fasting for 40 days water only? Or are we talking about like a vegetarian diet or kind of, or some of these longer fasts, maybe the Advent ones? Yeah. It, um, it, it, I would say this, the simplest answer is that it was mixed. So if, okay. I did a, a sort of historical analysis of this. And so early fast, what's funny is people think about the rule of St. Benedict in the Benedictine monasteries, where he told all the monks they had to eat one meal a day. And we look at that and think, oh gosh, that's tough. You know, this was actually, he was moderating what the Desert Fathers were doing because they were so hardcore, you know, and you hear these stories like St. Catherine of Siena, who for years lived on nothing but the Eucharist, which I assume was miraculous because you could not otherwise do that. Um, but generally what fasting meant was going some amount of time without eating. That's just what it meant. Um, and in a lot of places there would be accommodation in which uh, Christians would have say some, uh, some vegetables after uh, sundown and things like that. Um, and then over time, there were these kind of moderating qualities, but it, it always generally means at least not eating during the day, for sure. And then in the long fasting, like the long fasting periods, um, most people don't fast, just do a pure water only fast for 40 days, um, but some people do. So that's sort of the, the, the sort of ideal, um, but it's not what we normally think of, which is you just kind of give up well, I'm going to give up whiskey for Lent. You know, that's that's not fasting. That's abstaining. That's fine, uh -huh. but that's not a fast. And so, or so video think of games. it as you heard that yeah, one. Yeah, so that. giving up video games. That's fine. <laughs> Don't call it a fast. So you're abstaining from video games. But uh -huh. it's almost like we've gotten so far away from the original meaning of fast that we now apply it to things that don't even have to do with food. And so really think of the, the primary meaning of a fast is to do without food for some period of time. And you mentioned Catherine of Siena. I'm, would you yes. share a little bit with the group about what you learned about her? Because I think she's a particularly interesting one. She um, really is. And I'm really interested in her. So I'm a lay Dominican. So in Catholics, uh, in, uh, the, the Dominicans are a Catholic order that was started by St. Dominic. St. Thomas Aquinas was a Dominican. And then there's a lay order for lay people. So married people that are not priests and not, not monks or, or brothers. Um, that are lay Dominicans. She was actually a lay Dominican, even though she was consecrated and, and single. Um, and so she was, this, she, in fact, she's a doctor of the church. So she's an incredible spiritual theologian. Uh, she has amazing kind of miraculous life, but she got so intense in fasting that there were several years of her life where she would uh, go to communion every single day. Um, but effectively what that meant is, you know, consecrated host and consecrated wine, um, the body and blood, that's all she ate for several years. Now, I wouldn't advise this for anyone, and I say that in the book, like this is obviously miraculous because if you were to sort of calculate the ca calories of this, I mean, at the most, this would be 30 calories a day. And so this, you're just going to die. And so if you try actually tried this naturally, and so I assume that this is a kind of a miraculous sort of illustration, but it, you know, in what's funny about her is that when I first sort of heard about her, it's, it's odd because people hear this stuff and they think, 
you know, she must have just been completely crazy, you know, and you read some of the stuff that she said, you know, she must have just been completely crazy. But the more I studied, studied her, I realized, oh, this is just this amazing supernatural person in, in, in you know, in the Middle Ages that, that shone so brightly, kind of like St. Francis and some of these other people. And so we, well, you don't treat that as normative, obviously, for the ordinary person. Uh, but it, it, she, you know, it's this kind of amazing illustration of what's actually possible. And in, in this case, of course, I think there were these amazing supernatural graces that she benefited from. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed that portion because I think a lot of times people want to make her like, you know, equated with eating disorders or like, this is clearly exactly. a lie, this couldn't have really happened. And so I, I really liked the way that you shared her story and talked about your own kind of thinking and how it evolved on her specifically. Well, you know, I will say, because there, the, I had read this. And so um, it, it, it turns out that Catherine and there were a few other religious women like her at the time. And so you have to think about the status of women in you know the middle ages right it's not really great and yet god specifically chooses these women to have these supernatural manifestations and so some modern authors have written about them as if oh all these women they just obviously had eating disorders right it's all that was really going on um but there have been these a couple of books written by uh, uh female historians that just try to analyze them on their own terms that really are quite persuasive. They say, look, if somebody has, you know, a serious eating disorder, they have really psych serious psychological disorders, they're going to be disordered in certain ways. But when you read the lives of these women and their writings, that's not what it's like. It's just that they're kind of spiritual superheroes. And so it's just completely ridiculous to say, oh, this is all some kind of psychological disorder when you read them. No, it's just that they're massive outliers. And so in a sense, they're abnormal, but they're abnormal in the positive direction, not in the negative direction. Yeah, so fascinating. It, it, wants, it makes me want to learn more about it. And it makes me think of like Joan of Arc, you know, where there's yes, exactly. voices and and people want to make it into schizophrenia or, you know, yep. these things. And I think it's just trying to understand it in our modern vocabulary. No, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so many in this community fast for health benefits or for weight loss or for longevity. Um, how is spiritual fasting different? And do you believe that you can incorporate spirituality into your fasting practice, even if that wasn't your initial aim or intent? Absolutely. In fact, that's why I wrote the book, because um, as I tend to do when I get interested in the subject, I just sort of just breathed in all the literature. I ended up in PubMed reading the background studies to kind of separate the shaft from the wheat, because there's, you know, there's things that float on the internet that turn out not to be true when you look at do the research. Um, and I noticed there's basically, there's this kind of parallel literature there's all this literature now built up about so-called intermittent fasting. That's the thing that people talk about as the health benefits of fasting. And in some cases, like the, is it the, the North Point Clinic in California that's been doing it for several decades, but really this is a lot of this literature has emerged just in the last 10 years. And it's all about this, the physical benefits of fasting. And then you have books written periodically about the spiritual benefits in the last few, there haven't been many actually in Catholic circles. There's only a handful of books written about fasting in the last few years uh, by Catholics. And they almost always say, now this isn't the same thing as like, like dieting for physical benefits. They're always really careful to say, this is a totally different thing. Um, but I wanted to actually say, well, but if fasting is something God wants us to do and it's spiritually beneficial, why wouldn't it also be physically beneficial? I mean, we're, we're bodies. God gave us bodies. We believe as Christians believe in the resurrection of the body. Um, we're fallen, but it's, it's still a good thing. So it's not like our bodies are bad things that we need to get away from. Um, and so what I really wanted to do is to bring these together in an integrated way and to say, no, actually an integrated life is going to be one uh, in, in which you are ordered spiritually and you're ordered physically. And so to, for, in my view, I, I could care less how somebody comes to fasting. Um, that, that's just the way they got into it. And if the only thing you're thinking of is the physical benefits, and I want to tell people, you know, there's actually some amazing moral and spiritual benefits. There's benefits in terms of the increase of virtue, the delayed gratification that's involved. And so that's really what I wanted to do. But I could tell you when I first started writing about this, because I'm so excited, I'm, you know, writing articles on the internet. 
And a fellow Catholic down in the comments, in the com boxes, if you're an author, don't read the comments on your articles, you know. But this guy, called, he actually accused me of sacrilege for saying that there could be physical benefits to fasting. Uh, but to me, I mean, it's like, well, it's a really, it's an empirical question. If there's evidence that fasting uh, actually, get, uh, at least fasting in a certain way has physical benefits, why wouldn't I talk about that? And why wouldn't I treat that as a good thing? And my view is that God designed us actually to do this. We aren't designed to eat a certain way all of the time and to always have food coming in. And we're not designed always to just rely on sugar for fuel. We're actually designed to be metabolically flexible. And so we're, it's better when we don't eat sometimes and then we eat modestly most of the time and we we feast most of the time. It's It's sort of contrary to our design plan to do that differently. And so I really wanted to bring this together. Um, and it's because of that, that's how I got Jason Fung to actually write the foreword, because I thought, you know, he's, to me, he was like the, the, the smartest person on this stuff, the most balanced analyst on these things. Um, but we didn't know each other. And I, I just wrote him and I told him what I was doing. And he, I mean, he wrote me right back. I mean, it was like, he was sitting there at his computer. He said, oh, I'm so glad he said, I wanted somebody to take all the science and connect it to the spiritual stuff. And he said, but I'm not the person to do it. And so I'm glad you'll do that. Uh, and so that, you know, it was perfect, but it, it, I felt like I didn't need to be the person that wrote Jason Fung's book. He's, he did that, right? What I want to do is I wanted to integrate all that into the historical and the spiritual wisdom uh, that hadn't yet been connected to it. I, I love that. I know I was so impressed when I saw that he was the one who wrote your uh, your introduction here because yeah. <laughs> I'm a huge Dr. Jason Fung fan as a lot, a lot of people on this call. Um, and he actually, he, you know, some of them who have worked with him or who have been, you know, right. initial patients of his and things like that. So that's terrific. Um, yeah, I think he was a great choice. Uh, so for those who don't really have much of a spiritual practice, how would you suggest mm -hmm. for introducing this? Like, you know, do you, yeah. while you're fasting, make sure you like sort of pray or set an intention or, you know, read yeah. whatever scripture is, is relevant to you or, um, you know, and, and it could go multi-denominational yeah. this call for sure. Yeah, I definitely could. And so I focus mainly on the Christian tradition because that's what I know. And so I have a, a couple of friends who are Muslim. Um, and Muslims generally, I mean, fasting is a major deal. It's one of the main tenets of Islamic practice is that month of Ramadan. For those who don't know, Ramadan, um, it's on a lunar calendar, so it moves around over, over time. But it's basically a 30-day period in which Muslims do not eat anything between sunrise and sunset. And so if you live, let's say you live in the far northern hemisphere, you know, in, um, you know, I don't know, Crimea or someplace, you know, where this pretty far north and you're in Ramadan in the summer, you know, that could be an 18 hour period where the sun <laughs> stays up and you don't eat or drink. So they don't drink either. Um, now in recent years, there's actually journals, uh, academic journals, many written in pub English, fortunately, that have studied the physiological effects of this. And I actually uh, relied on some of that. The bad news is that in recent years lots of muslims have taken to get up right before sunset and they like gorge on donuts and then <laughs> they don't eat, and then they gorge on donuts when the sun goes down and so the physical benefits kind of you're kind of muting it um but i think you know the reality is i i i think humans are in fact both spiritual and material beings um we're not just ghosts trapped in bodies but we're also not just sort of glorified apes or these unique hybrids of the breath of God and the dust of the earth and the breath of God, as Genesis puts it. Um, and so those things are intended to go together, but for different people, it may manifest itself in different ways. And so I would say uh, the thing that I think is very common in religious traditions, common enough across totally different religious traditions that I think there's something kind of grounded in, in human nature in our, in our biology, honestly, is this fact that we are supposed to go periods of time without eating and, and the, really the, the nice thing about the christian calendar the traditional christian calendar is it actually maps out for you externally um it's very easy much easier if you have it sort of mapped out externally periods of time when you have these short-term fasts you know at a daily or a weekly schedule and then these seasonal fasts in which you do a kind of longer more hardcore thing and so something like that um, is really, really useful. And other traditions, of course, have that. And you could just sort of set it up your, yourself if you're not religious. Um, but I think there is something 
to that. I don't think it's a coincidence that there's something like that in almost all the religious traditions. Yeah, yeah. I agree. It's really interesting that, you know, it's like across the board. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that all but one reli major religion that we know of practices fasting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so there are some Zoroastrians and they mostly live, there's I think a few hundred thousand and they live, live mostly in Iran. And I see someone in the, in the comments, yeah, that pointed out um, in, in the Jew Jewish tradition. So there's Yom Kippur. Um, and so again, a fast from, from sundown to sundown. And then there's references to fasting, of course, in the Torah, and then other individuals that had fasts in a sort um, in the Hebrew Bible or in, in the Old Testament, in, in Daniel and some things like that. So um, you, see, you see a lot of it, but we tend to, modern Westerners, we just kind of read past it. We treat it like, okay, that's something people did a long time ago. Yeah, no, it's so true. That's how I used to read it too. <laughs> you know, I just yeah. assumed it was something okay. a long, long time ago before yes. modern conveniences. <laughs> yeah. If you were made Pope tomorrow and you could institute what you think Catholics should do and, and hopefully, you know, spread to others as well. Yeah. Um, in terms of fasting, what would you suggest that the Catholic Church adopt? I mean, I honestly think that we should return to what was done prior to all of the, you know, it's a complicated story I tell in the book about how we ended up with Catholics now. Basically, we fast fast an hour before communion. So basically, if you shower before you go to mass, you, you, you've done it, right? Um, and then during Lent, you only eat fish on, you, you no land meat on Fridays. Um, and then kind of a, two small meals and one regular meal on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. I mean, big deal, you know? And so I really think, uh, if you read the Catholic Encyclopedia, which is online, it's written in about 1910, even then it said that unfortunately fasting has fallen on hard times. And I really think part of the, I think a key problem and a reason we see so much kind of spiritual um, sloth and decay in the church is in part because we've basically given up this powerful spiritual weapon of individual fasting in corporate fasting. We still believe in praying together corporately, but we have just completely abandoned corporate uh, fasting and feasting. We sort of retain the feasts, um, but what's ironic is that if you don't actually precede a, a feast with a fast, you really don't even appreciate or grasp what a feast is. I mean, if you're eating everything you can possibly eat all the time, then what a feast ends up being is you just force yourself to eat more. Right? Well, that is not the same thing as if you've gone 40 days, for the most part, you know, really eating not very much at all and not eating a lot of the stuff you'd really like to eat. Man, that feast, that Easter Sunday feast hits, you appreciate it spiritually and physically and viscerally in a different way. And so I think in some ways we think we've retained the feast, but we've actually lost the true meaning of the feast because we dropped the fast. So I would, you know, I'd probably write an apostolic letter in encouraging a return uh, to a much more robust feasting schedule and calendar. And I would say, let's, let's look to the churches of the East for guidance on how we can recover that. I think that would also actually serve to bring Eastern and Western Christians together. Because if the Pope were to say, okay, I, as the Bishop of Rome, am telling all my fellow Western Catholics, look at what the Eastern Christians are doing. I think that could be itself a source of unity. So I won't be Pope anytime soon, but that's probably <laughs> what I would do. Cause I really, really do think, I mean, this is a passion of mine, but I feel like, okay, it may take me my whole life to persuade <laughs> even my fellow Catholics, but I really think that it is something that we have ab abandoned very much to our own detriment. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think if you, you know, I know it's not a, a democratic system, but if you did, you'd have a lot of votes from this call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, not, not well, it, it, in the College of Cardinals, it's democratic, but uh, yeah, it's, it's oligo oligarchy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. Um, all right, so now I'm going to switch to a few pre-submitted questions, and then we'll open Great. it up to the audience for questions. So if you have a question um, for Dr. Richards, please just write the word question or a cue in chat um, so we can kind of keep track in order of who would like to ask questions. And if you want to write out the text of your question there, that's great, but you don't need to. So, okay, submitted from Ben. Um, in your research, did you come across any church records that spoke to the benefits of fasting from a health perspective? 
like yeah. populations that fasted and tended to live longer or be less susceptible to certain kinds of diseases um, than those not practicing fasting? Yeah, it's a great question. And I was wondering the same thing, actually. And so, of course, they didn't have randomized, double-blind controlled studies at the time. So it's like it wouldn't have necessarily occurred to people that, you know, okay, this this culture, let, let's sort of compare them to a control group. But what you do find in church fathers and virtually every one of the saints, if you read what they actually say about fasting, they run together what we would think of as spiritual and physical benefits. So they talk about fasting will clear the mind, it strengthens the body, it heals the body of illness, it drives demons away. Notice what I did. It's like, you know, I, I move and they'll, they'll just run all of that together. So in some ways they didn't really think, okay, there's physical and spiritual benefits. They just talked about the benefits. And so you, same thing with St. Teresa of Avila. She talks about you know, when she was when she was fasting, she always felt stronger. She, her mind was clear. That's the other thing. So I think we actually know the physiological reason for that is is that if you're in ketosis, your brain's running on ketones. Anybody that's done this has probably experienced it. Your mind is actually clearer, and they experienced that and they talked about it sort of as a matter of course. So they didn't have this kind of simple bifurcation between physical and spiritual. They just talked about all the benefits of fasting and it was just sort of obvious to them. Um, but it's also that those passages are incredibly perplexing to modern interpreters because most people when they read that they imagine, okay, if I'm, you know, I've got to have my carb fix every four hours and I've been doing that for 40 years and I get lightheaded and I've, you know, and I think I have hypoglycemia because of that. Look, everybody doesn't have low blood sugar problems. We're just used to the sugar fix. Then you read Catherine, you know, saying uh, Teresa of Avila say this, and you think, well, that must be some kind of weird spiritual, you know, supernatural effect that it would make you clear or make you feel strong because obviously it wouldn't, it would make you feel weak. Well, no, if, you, if you're a practice faster, this actually makes sense to you. And so that's what's funny is that it's just that we've gotten so far away from fasting that these things are counterintuitive. I mean, let me tell, I don't remember if I told this story in the book or not, but when I first started working on the book, I thought I'm going to go around and I'm going to interview different religious orders and communities on their fasting tradition. And so I, I talked to some, uh, some Dominican sisters who were uh, sort of, so not lay Dominicans, but Dominican sisters, they're consecrated religious. Um, wore, where they wear habits. And so I thought, okay, they probably really hardcore fasters. And so I was, I had lunch with a couple of these sisters. I said, well, so do you guys, do y'all fast? And they said, oh yes, absolutely. We all fast. And I said, well, tell me about, you know, what you do. And she said, well, you know, we fast before communion and uh, we, we only eat fish on Fridays. Um, and she just named all the stuff that every kind of lame Catholic does. And I said, well, I mean, do you ever go say 24 hours without fasting or 36 hours? He said, oh no, we could never do that. We all teach. And so we would all be very lightheaded. And I realized this thing has just completely dropped out. Now that was some years ago. And I can tell you when I first started talking about this, this is how stuff has changed. Cause this group, is you, most of you are now, fam you're familiar with fasting, but I can tell you even three years ago or four years ago, if you brought up fasting to most people, unless you lived in California, people just thought that's just weird. Why would you do this? And so it wasn't until, you know, you got some tech gurus and entrepreneurs that started talking about it. And I remember a couple of years ago, Jack Dorsey, the head of Twitter, it got out that he fasts from Thursday night till Saturday morning. So that's a 36 hour fast. And they, the media called it extreme, but I can tell you two years earlier, it would have been more than extreme. It would have been called insane or disturbing or something like that and so i can tell you yeah. that even the, that was the response to me was initially like oh boy what kind of crazy thing have you gotten into and now it's i, I say it went from ex crazy to extreme to california fashionable and it's right now it's sort of fashionable so <laughs> that's a really funny way to put it yeah i think you know you're absolutely right that the widespread sort of you know general beliefs on it are really shifting um, I think that's really interesting. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, a couple of years ago, I think they would have called it dangerous, right? Not even- Oh just, yeah, absolutely. It, it would have been considered like terrible advice that he was putting out there. Um, so absolutely. it's really interesting to hear how it's shifted. All right, our next well, question- Well, and it's funny, I wanted to tell, Catherine, I wanted to tell you a funny story because when I wrote the proposal, I had written another book and you know, I have an agent. And so he gave it to some people. And so this, the head of this one publisher, it's a, it's a religion imprint at HarperCollins, he read my proposal 
Um, and it had my enthusiasm in it, right? It's just this 25 page proposal. And he didn't know anything about any of this stuff, but he does live in California, uh, in San Francisco. And so I guess he's sort of open to crazy things. And so he thought, well, I'm just gonna try this because I have this six week plan to ease people into fasting. And he thought, I'm just gonna try this. I'll just test it out. And sure enough, it, it worked. It, just what I said happened, what would happen, did happen. And that's how, that's how I ended up with the publisher I did is that the editor actually tried it. That is a fabulous story and what a great yeah. editor. I feel like most would yes. just turn it away without, you know, no. like, oh, this is crazy. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Exactly. That's so interesting. What a good guy. Yeah. Um, all right. So our next question is a bit of a personal one. So ready? Mm -hmm. um, and this comes from Cheryl. What are the spiritual benefits of fasting that you have personally experienced? Can you please respond without using dogmatic context? Rather, will you share with us the specific spiritual enhancements you have experienced as it relates to your relationships with God, your fellow being, hmm. and yourself. Oh gosh, yeah. And so, and so I'm not supposed to use kind of general things, but the sort of specific things that I have benefited from. <laughs> yeah, you're sharing that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I could say it, in some ways it's this. It's a broader thing um, in that, you know, I've talked about how if you do fasting right, it's not that hard, but it's still what I'm going to call scheduled suffering. Um, and so I think that there is a spiritual benefit, it, it, just like if you decide you're going to wake up every morning and pray um, first thing in the morning, um, you might think, oh, my mind is drifting and I can't stay focused for more than five seconds. Guess what? Join the human race. That's how we all are. But just the fact that you schedule it, that redounds to other aspects of your life so that other spiritual practices in some ways are easier. And so um, going to mass never feels like a burden, no matter what time it is. Morning prayer never feels like a burden. Um, I, I can't prove that my prayers are more efficacious because, you know, it's not like I've done, a, again, a controlled study to say, okay, my, does God answer my prayers more now? But I'm absolutely certain that in some ways it's a kind of a more integrated life. Um, and, and it's also weirdly... Um, it's, it's made me less, I mean, there's a kind of psychological anxiety that you can have uh, that could be a physiological thing, but you can also have a kind of spiritual anxiety which you just don't really trust that God is going to provide for you, whatever happens. And I have experienced that. And I, I honestly, I, I it definitely correlates to, um, to, to, uh, to fasting. And so in many ways, it, I, I, fasting is something that it's sort of, it's, it's an intended accompaniment to all of the other spiritual practices. Um, and, and then I also, I can tell you that the, the church calendar has come absolutely alive. So it felt a little arbitrary for me. So I did not grow up Catholic. I grew up Presbyterian. And so we didn't, I mean, we had kind of Advent and Lent, but basically it's Christmas and Easter, and then you don't know the church calendar. But if you're Catholic, every day is a saint day. I mean, there's sometimes there's three saints on one day, right? And all these kind of detailed things. But when you have this kind of syncopation of fasting and feasting and, and abstaining, all of that suddenly matters. Suddenly you actually know what Saint Day it is. And it, it, it's so the time suddenly becomes, um, it's like time is sanctified. The calendar is sanctified in a way. And so you feel yourself living your life with the, the sort of rhythm of the church and of these spiritual things. So I think almost more than anything, it's probably that. That is so interesting. That is really cool to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Um, sure. That's, you know, that's not what I would have expected. You sometimes hear people say like, oh, well, when you fast, like your uh, prayers get superpowers or like some of those <laughs> kinds of things, you know, it's like, it's scary. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe, but I, you know, I've never been a person that's been, you know, very few times, like I'm, I have friends that will say they prayed really hard and the Lord told them to do X and, you know, I'm, who am I to say, God knows, uh, I normally don't, you know, it's like, I don't know if God's telling me to do this or not. And so, um, but this is something that you I, I definitely kind of uh, feel much more concretely. Yeah, very cool. Thank you for sharing that. And great question, Cheryl. I'm, I'm glad you asked it. Um, so it looks like, and, and keep me honest, if I'm, if I miss somebody, call me out on it, but it looks like Kirk, you are the first person to write question in the chat tonight. Um, so would you like to come off mute and if you can on camera and ask your question? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Okay. We can. Yep. Good. Well, in medical school, we were taught when we got into the nutrition blocks that 
Mm -hmm. the century, people eat for various reasons, but they basically boil down to three. Out of sustenance to match the activity they're going to be doing out of habit. And of course, for the metabolic needs to satisfy mm -hmm. appetite. Mm -hmm. We also know that essentially appetite is created by two phenomena, the presence of cortisol, a stress hormone, and or insulin uh, as a result mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. sugar. So from the science end, we know that why we eat and what we're supposed to eat, hopefully, and the habits of eating. And I'm also a fellow Dominican, went to Christian high schools, the whole thing, Eucharistic Good. minister, that sort of thing. So on the spiritual side, we know fasting has always been sold as a form of penance, mm -hmm. something that we do in order to hold back in the case of sacrifice, Lent, things of that nature. And, and what you find is that this um, conflict that goes back and forth today is it seems that people use fasting as a nutrition and dietary discipline to achieve a scientific goal, i.e. losing weight. And then they use food in the absence of eating to, quote, repent or sacrifice or do something. And what my experience has been as a corporate psychologist, nutritionist, and doctor, that none of them works on either end mm -hmm. now in society. And so we've seen in the last 20 years gazillions of diets and we've seen people go from traditional medical practices to holistic to eating tree bark and all of these bandangle diets to combine with some sort of holistic internal healing. And what the problems that I have is that I think we need to keep things separate. We need to understand the dynamics of nutrition and why the body gains weight, why the body loses weight, and why the body's unhealthy. Yeah, and that's, there's a lot there. And so I, I should say, um, of course, I think we got to get the science right. And so I would want to say something as has a sort of physical benefit if it doesn't. Um, I think that what that what we want is an integrated life in which food has its proper place. Food should not be our God. And so very often we have disorders with relationship to our food. And so one can be where you hate it. Another can be that you worship it. Um, but I do think that people that try to fast or sort of dip their toe in, I mean, I didn't really, Catherine, sort of summarize my argument, but I'm absolutely convinced that the reason most people have a very hard time fasting or they don't benefit from it, or they might do it temporarily, um, is that we we sort of camp out on this one metabolic pathway. And in fact, even I've talked to physicians that don't, didn't even know this, uh, that we've actually, we, we're in some ways a hybrid. Our bodies can run well on fats uh, through a pathway called ketosis, and we can run well using sugars and converting uh, sugars to glucose. Our cells can use both of those things, but it tends not to do it simultaneously. And so um, unless, if you've fasted your whole life, or if you say, if you go two or three days without any, eating anything, your body will go into ketosis, but the really the only other way to go into ketosis to, to, to temporarily at least eat a ketogenic diet where you drop all the carbs way down, boost up the fats, and then you have this transition period in which your body starts using ketones. I'm, I'm convinced that we're actually designed uh, and work best when we're metabolically flexible. And so when we're in ketosis some of the time and we're out of ketosis some of the time so that we're using both of these systems, um, and so, but if you fasted your whole life, you will do that. But for most people that have lived their whole lives not fasting, then you need some time to kind of get that ketogenic system up and running. And so that's why I have this six week plan to get people sort of eased into ketosis so that once you start doing the longer fast, you have developed yourself metabolically so that you actually benefit from it. Um, I also actually think that the reason almost all diet, so-called diet plans end up failing is that if they are if they just involve a reduction of caloric intake the problem is i'm listening to a book today and they've said look if you just 
don't eat a hundred, you know, don't eat that bowl of cereal. That's 120 calories. You can lose a pound of fat a month, which makes sense mathematically. It's not true though, because you, what your body's going to do is it's going to downshift its, its meta, base metabolic rate. And so you might lose a little bit, but then your body adapts to that. The thing about fasting is that when you eat normally or you feast some of the time, and then you don't eat at all. That's your body has a completely different metabolic response than when you have persistent uh, uh, caloric deficit, which is what most diets unfortunately do. And so you might experience a little bit of uh, weight loss. It's really hard and unpleasant. And then you gain all the weight back. And so I think that's ironically, I think this diet on and off back and forth is itself a symptom of the fact that we've dropped these traditional patterns because, you know, the, the, um, you know, the pandemic of obesity and type two diabetes and high blood pressure. These are so-called diseases of civilization. These are, you know, the obesity epidemic is, is a fairly recent phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, so true. I agree with everything, but I'm going to go to the next question just to keep, it, <laughs> keep us moving. Um, Stephanie, are you able to hop on camera and ask your question? And if not, I'm happy to read it for you. Um, sure, I think so. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so I'm pretty new to getting back in the church um, after mm -hmm. being out for a while. So I've been in maybe about a year and I don't know much about the schedules. I'm kind of in a non-denominational. So I was wondering if you right. had anything like a traditional like fasting schedule for the Advent and Lent. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, and so the easiest thing, I actually, I reproduce, I think that 2018 or 2019 Eastern Orthodox fasting schedule. But if you Google that, Google the, the Christian Eastern Orthodox fasting schedule, and I'm not telling you that's the one you have to do, but if you get a imp strong impression of where the dates land, and of course they vary slightly from year to year, uh, and, and that's the kind of the easiest thing to do. Um, and I should say that there are lots of evangelical churches that fast as well. And in fact, I, I point that out in, the, in is that Catholics attach fasting to the church calendar. Um, I know a guy, Jen, Jensen Franklin, who has a big church in the South, and his church actually, it's evangelical, has a three-week fast that starts January the 1st and goes for three weeks, and a bunch of members of the church do that. And so that people have these kind of different fasting things. I really do think, though, that there is a benefit to the uh, to connecting your fasting to the liturgical calendar because it has this kind of variations. And as it happens, there are these physical benefits uh, that accrue to different time scales of fasting. And so you can affect, you know, your blood sugar levels are affected dramatically if you do the daily fasts. The longer fasts above 72 hours, your cells kick into autophagy. And so I, the nice thing about the liturgical calendar is it just sort of provides that for you. So yeah, as in most of these things, yeah, Google Eastern Orthodox fasting calendar and it will, you'll get a lot of stuff. Great, thanks. Um, Jean from Tampa, you are up next with your question. I know you submitted it beforehand, so I'm happy to read it. Um, but if you would like to come on, on camera and unmute yourself and share your question directly um, about uh, scriptures, I'm happy to. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably do better. We'll probably do better if you just read it, Catherine. Oh, okay. <laughs> Perfect. Good. I can do that. It's nice to see you though. Um, so the question is, is there scripture that recommends or tells us specifically to fast? If not, why do it for spiritual reasons? Yeah, it's a great question. In fact, I think it's like the first thing I deal with in the book because um, there's no place that Jesus says to fast. Now there are examples of fasting and there's ex examples in the Old Testament. Um, and the, the simple answer is that it's clear that Jesus presupposed that we would fast. So, um, you know, there are things that Jesus commands directly and there's other things that he assumes. So remember, let me just pull up the verse here. I'll just read it for you if you give me a sec. This is from Matthew 6, 16. Um, so Jesus says, he says, when you pray, when you give alms, and when you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by men. So he assumed that his followers would fast, just as he assumed they would pray and that they would give alms, that is, that they would aid the poor. Um, in fact, those almost always go together, praying, fasting, and giving alms. Um, and so Jesus presupposed that. So it wasn't a matter of sort of commanding that they not do it. And then he also, of course, later, remember that the Pharisees come and say, why are your, your 
followers not fasting. And he says, well, you're not going to fast during the feast and the bridegroom is here. They will fast when the bridegroom leaves. In other words, after he dies and he ascends to heaven. And so that's why the church for 1500, you know, for thousands of years now has assumed that this was something that we were supposed to do um, just as, you know, just as we pray. And so um, in many ways, the, this was one of these things that Jesus just assumed that we would do rather than something he had to tell us to do. And then, of course, he himself was a, a supreme example of this. So the, the very first thing he did, he lived his life for 30 years. And then before he starts his earthly ministry, what does he do? He goes into the desert and he fasts for 40 days. Now, this is Jesus, the Son of God incarnate. The first thing he does uh, before he battles the princes and prin the principalities and powers, the dominions of evil, right, is this mother of all boot camps, a 40-day fast in the desert. And then what happens? At the end of the 40 days, Satan shows up and challenges him. And so I think he both assumed we would fast uh, and he gives a supreme example of fasting. And then you have the testimony of Christians historically. Uh, and then, of course, there's the reference um, that's a kind of complicated passage in which there's this reference uh, in which some of Jesus' followers go out and they're trying to exercise demons and they don't work. And there's this reference that some of these can only come out by fasting and prayer. This idea that there's this, sometimes you, even if you're saying everything right and just praying, it doesn't do it. And so there's this implication that sometimes fasting adds power to prayer, which is a, a very interesting kind of reference. So in some ways, Fasting was so much a part of the mental furniture of the ancient Near East and of first century Judaism and Christianity that it would have been, it would have been just sort of obvious. That's why he just says, when you fast, do, do it this way. Don't, basically, when you fast, don't tell everybody, oh, I'm fasting and I'm really hungry because that, you know, then you're getting your reward effectively. Yeah, great question. Um, Deirdre B., you are up next. I know you had a few questions in there, so maybe pick the one that you're you're most excited to talk uh, to Dr. Richards about. Are you able to uh, come on camera and unmute yourself? I'm right here. Thanks so much. I'm um, enjoying you. all of the conversation. It's great. Thank you, Dr. Richards. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of answered some of the questions, but I'm going to ask this specifically. Are you at liberty to kind of share your fasting regimen? Is it the Christian sure. Orthodox? Um, yep. I, I yeah. In fact, oh, this is your. Yeah. Here's your question right here. So I follow right. basically what I described, and so I do not do. I'm I'm Western Catholic and not Eastern Orthodox, and so um, and also so Catholics are sort of at liberty to do this a lot of different ways. But I think there's wisdom in this traditional pattern, and so I fast, um, and it varies from different times of the year. But I always fast on Wednesdays and Fridays at least. Like it may just be one meal a day. So like today and Friday or after Easter, I'm doing one meal a day. So basically I eat after, you know, at night. Um, but sometimes actually on Wednesday and Friday, I don't eat, I, I fast entirely. So those are two 36 hour fasts in that case. Um, I always mark Sunday. Now, the reality is sometimes, you know, there'll be a wedding on Friday. And so what I do is I just pick another day of the week to do that. Um, and then I follow um, in the uh, what are called the Ember Days, which we've not talked about. So the Ember Days is another traditional fast that happens four times a year, sort of at the joints of the seasons, but they they vary from year to year. And what they are, it's a Wednesday, Friday, Saturday fast. And so on the Ember Days, I will do a 36 hour fast on Wednesday. So don't eat on Wednesday, don't eat on Friday, and then don't eat on Saturday. It's a little harder because that's a, what is that, a 60 hour fast. So basically, that, that second round, right, I, um, I eat on Thursday and then I don't eat again until Sunday. So that's a Friday and Saturday, you know, on Ember Days. And then I always fast basically from Thursday until Sunday um, during Lent before Easter. Um, and, I, you know, I sort of vary what I do at Advent and Lent, but I always do something different. So it might be that every single day is... Um, I only eat one meal a day or I only eat four meal four, uh, during a four hour period of the day or something like that. And then you had something else here. Um, and so I don't quite know the longest I've ever fasted, but in a normal, within a year, I sort of three days is normally about as long as I do, though I think I've gone up to five, but I don't generally do that. Um, I, you know, some people do. Um, I don't carry a lot of extra weight on me. And, um, you know, at least liturgically, 
um, there's no there's no period longer than 72 hours. And so I would just be doing a longer fast kind of on my own. Um, but there are lots of people, including like Dr. Jason Fung, for a lot of people that have, you know, really serious uh, health problems. And you, if you, you, you're doing it under doctor supervision, he can do seven, seven to 14 day fast. But if you're doing something that long, that's tough. And then I, I really like, I think it's an important question. You say, how long do you estimate it would take to person new to fasting to wean themselves from sugar? And so um, I think if you're doing that, the program that I have in the book is designed first to get your body used to ketosis. And so you like a transition into ketosis so that your body basically fires up its capacity to use both stored body fat and dietary fat as fuel. Um, and th and you, that's, you really want, I'm just absolutely convinced that that is the easiest way to do this so that you're getting all the calories you need, your body feels good, and then you wean yourself habitually off of sugar. And I don't think the goal is to never use sugar. It's just that, um, it's just that if you spent your entire life doing one thing, they're going to be a bumpy transition in order to get yourself used to that. But I, I think it's actually about six weeks. I, it's a wonderful kind of providence that that's how long Lent is. It looks like from what I can tell, that's about how long it takes for your body to get so-called fat adapted. Because what happens is that your cells actually, the mitochondria change uh, after a period of time when you're in ketosis because your cells get used to using, it's like, okay, fat's the thing that I'm going to use for fuel now. And so your cells re respond to this. I actually think, and this is my general hypothesis, that we are designed to use both of these metabolic systems. And so you want to be moving in and out of ketosis and not staying in and all the time. Um, but if you fast and you eat a certain way, like the way I described in the book, you're going to sort of naturally do that. But you know, if anything you've done for 40 years, you've habituated, expect it to be tough at the beginning. Just what I say is, okay, expect it to be a sacrifice, but it shouldn't be torture. It's something that I think is, is totally doable for, for the ordinary person. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, somebody mentioned Angus Barbieri, who is a famous Scots, uh, Scottish man who fasted. He, yeah, he went 38, 382 days on a water fast in 1965. This is well documented. But he weighed 400-ish pounds when he started. So he carried a whole lot of, of, of extra food for fuel, you know. And so the, the amount of time a person can fast is going to be very... It very individually variable, needless to say. I bet his story is incredible, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> really? it, seems like, it seems like clickbait. It seems like the kind of thing where you'd see like exactly. 300 pounds in 382 days, you know? <laughs> like, yes, I looked up the I looked up the research on him to make sure, because this stuff, just because you see it in five places on the internet doesn't mean it's true. But yeah, he, he's name? well documented. His name is Angus Barbieri. Yeah. Uh, and he was Scottish. He went to the doctor. He said, I need to go on a diet. What can I do? And these doctors at the clinic weirdly just said, well, you know, fast for a few days. <laughs> you know, I'm just kind of like, try fasting for a few days. And then he was going to come back. And he came back after five days. He said, well, I was fasting. And I got to like the fourth or fifth day. And people report this. You get to the fourth or fifth day. And all of a sudden, it's like your body gets used to it. And so he didn't really feel hungry anymore. And so he took a vitamin and drank water. He just just kept doing it until he hit like 165 pounds or something. So it's, and there are other stories like that now. His is just a really well-documented one. No, it's incredible. It's really extreme. And if you're looking for it, Deirdre, it's, um, we have a link to it actually on our resources page on the fastingflamingo.com because I just thought it was, I mean, it's the world record fast. He set the record. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Um, I thought it was too good a story not to, not to try to hype and help publicize. Um, yeah. Not that obviously it's something we recommend anybody ever do, you know, <laughs> right. kind of at home kind of thing. But and I, one of the things I loved about the story too was he, um, he just wanted to keep going and his doctors were like trying to talk him out of it. Like, no, 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 don't keep going. Like, we don't know what's going to happen. And he was just adamant that like he was going to keep doing this. So they kept checking his vitals and they just kept getting better and better. And so it just continued. Absolutely. Pretty cool story. So I know we're right at, at the top of the hour. Thank you so much for doing this with us, absolutely. Dr. Richard. This was, this no, was it's, special. No, and, absolutely. It's one of my favorite things to do is to talk to people, especially people that are just kind of dipping into this and trying to figure this stuff out. Because I know it's very complicated. There's a lot of stuff on the internet. There are a lot of ways to go wrong on this stuff. Um, it really, there's a lot of flim flam out there. And so it's kind of separating the shaft from the wheat is difficult, but I think that it's, it's, it's a great time and I just encourage you all uh, and I'm encouraged by you all that you're, you're looking into this. 
where's the best place for people to go if they want to connect with you and learn more about the book and yeah so here. you can um you can follow me on twitter at dr j richards um you can i write uh at a website called the stream which i helped launch a few years ago i don't just write on this stuff um and then if you're interested in buying the book um just you know any place you get a book books at barnes and noble or amazon obviously um and there is a study guide a free study guide if you google um, eat fast feast study guide that's up at the HarperCollins website that you can oh, use to go along with it. So that's so good to know because um, for those who are members of the Fasting Flamingo, we're actually doing this as our next book club book. We voted on it uh, this past Sunday. And so um, I think mid June we'll start reading your book. So that's great to know there's a study okay. guide. We can kind of use that to help. Oh, absolutely. Help yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And then um, just a couple quick announcements. So we have a group fast that will be starting the first Monday of June. So if you're interested in doing that with us, um, there'll be a, a 24, a 48, a 72 hour variety. Um, so keep your eyes out on the Fasting Flamingo Facebook group. Um, and also, um, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, that's where I will be posting the recording of this video. So if you want to see it, or you want to see any other stories of some of the people in our community that have been fasting. And then hopefully when we start doing a few more religious um, uh, ones as well, covering different religions, we'll be posting those there as well. Um, so thank you all so much for joining tonight. This was really fun. And I so appreciate you doing this with us, Dr. Richard. And Absolutely. Great to be with you all. Yeah. Thanks. Take care and have a wonderful week, everyone. All right. Happy God fasting. Bless. Thank you. <laughs> Catherine, what's the YouTube again? Yes, it's The Fasting Flamingo. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and if you don't mind clicking the subscribe button, you'd be helping me out because we just launched it. So it's it's still pretty new. I'll go right now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye. Nice to see you. Take care. Love you.